mana bases. Am I right? They have to exist. They help you play your magic cards. You want to play your magic cards. And often, an optimal mana base can be the difference between victory and defeat in and of itself. And yet a lot of us just want to play our cards. We don't put enough stock into mana bases. And look, me, of all people, I give why. Once you're done with the deck idea, that's enough work in and of itself some of the times. You got your two ideas that came to you in the middle of the night, and you're like, oh, these two cards can go together really well, and you put them together, and then you spend the next three weeks having shower thoughts about what other cards could possibly work with this combo, and then after two months, you finally got a 36-card engine that purrs just the way you want it to. And then, you gotta build the mana base? Come on, man, I'm done with the deck at this point. <laughs> Right. I see a lot of you clicking away from deck techs once you get to the mana base. And again, I understand why you feel like you've already seen the deck at that point. And I've been there too. Long, long ago before we even had the internet, we had Inquest magazine, The Duelist, and other magazines like that, right? And all of those had plenty of deck techs in them. I did the exact same thing. I would peruse through the main deck, be like, oh, that's a cool idea right there, get the, the mana base, and be like, oh, I'm done with this, and chuck the magazine into a fire behind me. There's always a fire behind me. I don't know what that was, but anyway, I get it. Mana bases don't seem interesting, but once you actually get down to the nitty gritty of what it takes to master mana bases, it can be a very interesting thought exercise as to why you're doing the things that you're doing. So today, I just kind of wanted to go through that with you guys, and yeah, I'm back and alive. I have someone's been trying to to kill me i don't know what it is but over the last week i have been sick with the thing wink that i can't say or else i'll risk the first youtube video i've done in a week getting demonetized and getting the yellow dollar sign of death i've been sick with the thing you know what it is but um that said i just I, you can't keep me down i'm gonna keep getting up i am unkillable the immortal Deb from SBMTG. So today, we're going to do something uh, probably even more painful than the things I've been through in the last week and go through building the mana bases for a few different decks in standard. And yes, you can tell that I still have a little bit of that laryngitis or some stuff in my throat. I apologize for that. If it affects your viewing experience, then that sucks for both of us because I was really hoping you'd have a great viewing experience. I was really hoping that would be awesome for you. So I apologize in advance for that. But let's talk first about how to build a mono red mana base. Hello, like I said, we're going to look at a mono red deck first. And there's a reason for that. We want to start with kind of the simplest mana base that you can build right now, or basically at any time, but also display why there are little nuances and little tricks that you want to use even in the simplest of mana bases. Now, check out this little mono red goblins deck right here. It was actually kind of a neat little deck all things considered but we haven't really added lands to it yet so let's do that real quick we'll go through our thought process now you may notice there's 25 spots for lands in this aggro deck and it's because i know that i want to include some mdfcs which aren't quite lands aren't quite spells they occupy a weird spot in terms of how you do the numbers right for your mana bases and your main decks and all that but i know that i want two spike field hazards in here there's plenty of reasons for that in and of itself right this can just deal direct damage directly to the opponent and there's tons of x ones right now but there's going to be other turns where you do want to say play a three drop and also thundering rebuke or reckless impulse and still have mana left to play something that turn so it is important that you get to play these as lands sometimes you need more than three or four lands even though the curve stops at three so we are effectively going to play 25 lands in the stack but that doesn't keep us from playing important spells like spike field hazard now not everyone's going to do this but i'm going to include a copy of shatter skull smashing in the deck we're the kind of aggro deck to where if we get shatter skull smashing and say a spike field hazard in our opening hand we can probably play the spike field on turn one if we don't have a one drop right then turn two hope to draw a mountain if we don't we can bite the bullet pay the three life for the shatter skull it's not too big of a deal hopefully we're depleting our opponent's life total faster than they're depleting ours so it shouldn't hurt too much if you have to play this shatter skull smashing untapped as a land but if you do happen to get into the late game against another creature based deck or a tokens based deck for instance then you might be able to actually take out two smallish creatures right if you end up having five to six mana you can take out a couple of two twos or two a, a two toughness and a one toughness and sometimes that can be really important for a goblin deck i don't think you have to play shatter skull smashing but i think you can play shatter skull smashing 
Now our next question is how many creature lands can our monocolored aggro deck fit? Now, when it comes to Den of the Bugbear, I actually think that Den is probably the best creature land for a monocolored aggro deck, period, because it's, you know, costs less relative to say a Cave of the Frost Dragon. It makes two creatures, uh, basically, right? Unlike say a Hive of the Eye Tyrant. A Hive of the Eye Tyrant isn't in a very aggro color to begin with. So not only do we get to play a lot of very aggro creatures in our red deck, but we also get a relatively streamlined, fairly easy to activate creature land. So I'm actually cool with adding four Den of the Bugbear in this deck to begin with, especially considering in this Goblin stack, this makes a Goblin. So it's even better than usual. I think four is okay in this version of the deck. The next question is how many of these legendary lands do we want to add to a mono-colored deck? Now, kind of depends again on what color you're in. There are some mono-white decks that'll play two copies of Iganjo because it's so good. There's mono-green decks that'll play two copies of Beseju because it's so good. Some of these, you know, if they do play green, often they're teamer land destruction decks. They'll play three copies of Beseju and then, or Beseju, and then another one in the sideboard, and they do that because they can just play it as a land destruction spell, basically. Uh, when it comes to Sakenzin, I don't think you need to play really more than one of these uh, a lot of the time. <laughs> so I'm just going to add one, but I could see it making a case for adding two of these, but I'm not going to do it. I just really don't like drawing the second one at all, especially in games where you end up drawing Sakenzin, Sakenzin Mountain. And that just feels really, really bad. I don't want the chance of that happening, so I'm just playing one copy. Now, you might think the rest is just add mountains, but that's not necessarily true, right? We gotta look at our colorless lands because a monocolored deck, even an aggro deck like this, should have a couple of spots for colorless lands if it wants them. So do we want Crawling Barons? Probably not, but it is anti-vanishing verse and it's not the worst land in the world right now. Should point that out. Probably the best colorless land in standard is Field of Ruin. We don't want to be using this card if we don't have to be, right? Because it costs two mana. And really, we'd rather be using our mana to play creatures and spells and stuff like that. But I got to tell you right now, I'm probably going to add one Field of Ruin to this deck because there's ostensibly no reason not to play one copy of Field of Ruin, right? Because almost any mana that we get, let's say we want to play Hobgoblin Bandit Lord on you know, turn three on curve. Well, if we draw our one field of ruin, we can still play the Hobgoblin Bandit Lord on turn three. This will never keep us from being able to play basically any of the cards. If we start with one field of ruin in our hand, that's the only way that maybe we won't be able to play a Goblin Javelinier or something. But I still think that's probably worth it considering field of ruin can take out creature lands that would otherwise be able to block. So at this point, now I think we're ready to add mountains. The question was how many mountains are we going to end up with? The question is 16. If the question is what mountains are we playing? Well, the answer is always, 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 no matter what basic land, Mirage Basics. We're playing Mirage Basics. That's the answer. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering why I'm over here, so I can do this occasionally. But don't worry, we're not going to be stuck on this view forever because I'm also going to, once we have the full mana base built, do this for you because I'm a very nice man. See, this is what we ended up on. I think that we should stick with four Den of the Bugbear in our Mono Red Goblins deck. It's the only lands in the deck that come into play tapped except for the Spike Field Hazard and potentially the Shatter Skull Smashing. But with effectively 25 lands in the deck, that's still 16, 17, 18 untapped lands and 20 of them in the first two turns. So I think that should be enough to play effective aggro. Again, this is not where everyone's going to land. Some people are not going to play Field of Ruin in this deck, but I just don't see a lot of reasons not to. Again, the number one reason is because you might draw a one lander and two one drops, right? But in that case, I think you should throw it back anyway. So no harm, no foul. But aside from that, no, some people are going to play two Sokinzen. I don't think you need to do that. Some people are going to juice the, you know, creature lands even more by playing things like Crawling Barons. I don't think you have the slot for more than one colorless land in this deck if you're even going to do that. So all things considered, this is the mana base I would end up on. But again, there are other options for even the simplest of mana bases. This is why, in a way, I think it's important to study them because you can be done with the deck after the first 36 or so cards all you want to, but there are so many little decisions that get made when making a mana base that I think are somewhat interesting, even if it's for a monocolored deck. But let's move on to a two-colored deck next. 
Now for deck number two, we've got kind of an interesting little pile here. It's kind of a Selesnia ramp deck that cares about lands. You might notice that there are 29 open spots for lands in this deck. There are reasons for that. As you see, we've got Azusa's Many Journeys in the two drop slot that requires that we play a lot of lands. Topiary Stomper requires a lot of basics. Yasharn, that requires a fair number of basics. Ashaya could require a disproportionate number of forests, possibly if you can make that argument. And of course, Sanctuary Warden and Titan of Industry require lots of green and white sources respectively. Well, white and green sources respectively, if you're gonna actually use the term respectively correctly. Um, and lots of land, just period. Uh, but there's a lot of cool little tricks in this uh, deck right here <laughs> that really aid you, um, benefit you for adding lots and lots of lands to your deck. So let's get to it. Now the first thing we're going to do is add four branch loft pathways to the deck as well as four overgrown farmland and I think that's more or less a no-brainer. Now, you could add other stuff to the deck. You could add Botanical Plaza, or Blossoming Sands, or the Green White Snow Land, especially if you had something that searches for snow lands or something like that. But honestly, I don't think that's the best idea. The best thing I would advocate for here is maybe one copy of Botanical Plaza at the absolute most. But even then, very likely not. You're going to have to have lands that come into play untapped. They're gonna be very, very important to draw on a lot of our turns. And adding these just increases the likelihood that we won't get them when we need them. There's also the fact that we need lots and lots of basic lands for the stack for reasons I've already stated, so we don't necessarily need to have a ton of dual lands in this deck unless we want to replace some of these dual lands with more budget dual lands, but once you have these lands in the deck, I really don't think that you need to go about putting more dual lands in. Now for this deck, we are going to play some number of creature lands and these channel lands and all that, but what number? is the question. Now I'm going to start with just one of each of these and we may go up as time goes on, but one Beseju, one Lair of the Hydra, one Cave of the Frost Dragon, and again one Eganjo, just to start things out and we'll see how we feel come back to them a little bit later. Now let's look at NDFCs next. An NDFC that I really want to play in this deck is Tangled Florahedron, right? Because it's a ramp deck, we need more two drops in the deck, and it's just more lands, and that's always good. We can go Asusa's Many Journeys on turn two and then immediately play Tangled Veil. So, seems good to me. I'm going to go ahead and add four of those. Do we want Kazandu Mammoth? I don't think so. I think we have just enough three drops already. Six doesn't seem like a lot, but we're hoping to get an extra mana on turn two and skip straight from two to four on the next turn. So we don't need as many three drops in this deck and Restoration of Iganjo, one of our three drops, ramps us. Topiary Stomper also ramps us. So if we have to skip ramp on turn two, well, hopefully we can get ramp on turn three, right? That's kind of all we're trying to do in the first two to three turns of the game. So I don't think we need to play another three drops. And if we were gonna play another three drop, I would want it to ramp. And Kazandu Mammoth doesn't quite do that. Although it does work with the fact that we're playing so many lands. I still don't think it's quite what we're looking for. Now I am gonna play a turn timber symbiosis in the deck, which you don't necessarily have to do, but you know, you're looking for creatures from the top seven of your library with a turn timber symbiosis. It means you can catch a Titan of Industry or a Sanctuary Warden, or an Ashaya, or a Yasharn, and those are all ridiculously good targets. Um, with a turn timber symbiosis. So I'm going to try that out. <laughs> Just one copy of that. And we might as well because we're a ramp deck anyway, right? We have these these haymakers at the top end of our curve. Why don't we add one that we can just play as a land for free when we need to? But the better of these land haymakers is definitely a Miria's Call. I'm gonna play two copies at least of this card. Now again, this is one that I may come back to later and add more copies of, but I highly doubt it at this point based on what things are shaping up to look like, right? Again, Restoration, we need basic planes for. Topiary Stomper, basics for. We need basics for Yasharn, right? So we need a fair amount of basics for the deck. And usually, the predominant wisdom when you have, say, these three mana rampers like Topiary Stomper that go get a land. Predominant wisdom, prevailing wisdom, one of those colloquialisms, is that you need to play 10 basic lands in your deck to make that actually work. So, you know, you could look at things like Ondu Inversion, but that kills our Planeswalkers and stuff, right? You could look at Kabira Takedown. Do we have enough creatures? Slizuri Shelter, do we have something we want to protect that badly? Not really, considering we have Titan of Ministry and Sanctuary Warden, which both have shield counters. Right, so you don't necessarily need that stuff. We've already looked at the green MDFs, so. Honestly, 
I'm fairly certain that our mana base looks pretty good from here, and we can just add green and white basics. We might even want to take a card out, but we'll see about it. Let's take a look quickly at the makeup of our deck. Now, you can do that over here by pressing, you know, the little deck icon. Our deck has 25 green cards and 14 white cards. Plus, we already added two Emirius Calls and only one turn Timber Symbiosis. So, we definitely want more green sources than we want white sources, and that much is fairly obvious. So, let's just hit this. Add our Mirage Lands to three. Four. And then add our Mirage Force. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think that that's probably what I'd want to do. Now, how many sources does that give us? All in all, that means that we have 4, 8, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 white sources, all considered. And that's not too bad. As far as green sources, we have 4, 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 green sources, which is, again, probably about where we want to be, considering we have to cast Titan of Industry, Turn Timber Symbiosis. Um, Ren and Seven Ashaya, we definitely, Topiary Stomper on three. Um, quick tip here, if you want to cast cards on turn three, then most of the time, you know, that have double pips in them, then most of the time you need 18 sources. But we do have Tangled Florahedron, so really we kind of have like 21 green sources in the deck on turn two, uh, or by turn two or whatever. Uh, so that should be plenty. Again, normally you want 18 sources of a color be able to double pip that color by turn three we should have plenty with 21 so this again let's go to the the better view i think a lot of people would call it <laughs> here we are <laughs> and let's take a look at how our mana base ended up here again you know what was it 14 white sources uh 21 green sources all things considered not bad at all especially when if we sound like we're a little bit low on white sources we've got restoration of a ganjo and yasharn to help us get those white sources. If we don't have our second white source, by the time we need a Wandering Emperor, that can suck, but we've got Restoration to help us get it on turn three, and of course, Yasharn to help us get it if we don't have it yet. So, you know, lots of ways to get those white sources that you need, but mostly we need green in the deck. You know, Topiary Stomper can help go get a white source for you if you don't have one by turn three, so you know, that'll help you cast Wandering Emperor and all that, so. All in all, this is the mana base I think I'd stick with. I wouldn't increase the number of creature lands or legendary lands or MDFCs or anything like that. And I think we're good with 10 basics. It will make late Yasharns a little bit worse, but I think that's okay. But up next, let's take a look at a three color deck. And since we looked at Selesnya last time, which is not really a deck people play, I'll agree with you, with commenter. Uh, let's look at a deck everyone plays. Let's, let's just build the most important mana base in the entire format right now, and that is Esper Mana. <laughs> so far, we got about 36 slots in this deck for lands. How do we fill them? Well, let me tell you, this is the only mana base in the, in the whole video that I didn't make myself. I actually pulled this mana base from a 7-in-1 list at a recent tournament just to make you absolutely for sure confident in the fact that this is very much a professional, I guess, mana base uh, that did very well at a tournament, right? So let's just say, first of all, this mana base plays an Emiria's Call. I would not have thought that, but it makes plenty of sense when you actually do think about it. Emiria's Call, you know, th this deck's going to go into the relative late game a good bit of the time, and even though you don't want a bunch of these, you don't want two of them, and they gum up your hand in the early game, you gotta take damage to them, and you're falling behind the other Esper deck across the table or whatever, right? What you do want every now and again, though, is to draw this on turn 15 <laughs> when the game has gone long, and just blow them out with it, right? And it does have some cool things. It's a token. The deck cares about tokens in a number of ways. You can make them bigger with a Luminarch Asper you know, there's a few cool things about an Amiria's Call. If you got a Kaito sitting on the board, you play Amiria's Call, you can swing with your guys, draw a card. Like, there's good things. <laughs> it increases the number of creatures that are attacking with a Rafine on the table. That means more connives. You know, a lot, again, lots of reasons why you might want to play the one Amiria's Call, but I could see not wanting to draw more than one of these in a game. And if you, since you're only playing one, you keep drawing it to a minimum, you won't draw it, hopefully, theoretically until late, late in the game when you can actually play it and it matters to you. So I get the idea of playing the one copy of this card. 
Something else that maybe surprised me a little bit, not gonna lie, is the one copy of Hive of the Eye Tyrant that showed up in this list. But honestly, you do end up seeing this in a fair number of Esper lists nowadays. It's just the best creature land that this color combination can play. Now you might think it would be Hall of Storm Giants, the blue one that you know makes a 7-7 seven, seven or whatever. That's not terrible, but note that this deck definitely splashes blue. Mostly a black-white deck that has some blue cards in it here and there, right? So usually when you're splashing a color, you're not going to be playing that creature land because it kind of means that you have to have double of that color just to activate the creature land when you really think about it, right? So that means that you're probably going to stick to one of your dominant colors to play a creature land if you're going to do it at all. And they went with Hive here. Not only is it less to activate, but Menace is not as good as flying, but in some cases just as. <laughs> and being able to get a card from their graveyard is incredible in a lot, a lot, a lot of situations where <laughs> you're playing against, you know, the Galvanic Iteration decks or the, um, you know, uh, the Arcane Bombardment decks or the God. There's a million of them in standard right now. Just anything that wants to dig around in its graveyard. And right now that's a many, many decks in standard so it's really nice to be able to have a hide of the eye tyrant not only to deal some damage after a sweeper you know stay on board and all that stuff but also just completely erase your opponent's game plan if they care about their yard so that's good too but here's where things actually get really really easy for a second because you just play four of every single relevant pathway no thinking involved whatsoever just all all the pathways that you might want to play just play four of those and then you play four copies of Rafine's Tower. 16 of your slots taken care of. That's right. Right now, if you are a three-color deck in standard, the prevailing wisdom is to just play all of the pathways in whatever tower is available to you, all in four ofs, and just don't even think about it. Now, when it comes to chill lands, slow lands, whatever we're calling these, three, three lands, threes company, lands uh, these can be a little bit harder to figure out but in this case what they ended up doing was going with two deserted beach one shipwreck hive and then two shattered sanctum so what they did there was they took their dominant colors and they mostly played two of those white is the most dominant color in this deck you need you know three white pips for Amiria's call two white pips for both of your four drops right so it's very important that you get your white mana in this deck so they just kind of prioritize that and then as far as shipwreck marsh goes uh, or whatever yeah shipwreck marsh down here um you only need one of those because it doesn't make white i guess was the idea <laughs> but you, you're gonna need blue or black every now and again and dual lands tend to be very very good in three color decks much better than pathways in fact now you may notice there's three slots left and the way they chose to fill this out was one copy of the ganjo because you know it's removal <laughs> straight, complete straight up removal you might think they would add a takenuma to get back some of these planeswalkers or something like that or maybe they'd add the you know a tawara the blue one but no again blue's a splash if you draw a blue source you probably want to actually play it you very likely need it um so because there's just not a whole lot of those in the deck so they decided to fight against field of ruin by playing a planes and a swamp by the way swamp is the best of all the mirage lands uh and i won't be taking questions about that it just is look it's the best of the mirage lands now if you end up against the cleansing wildfire arcane bombardment deck you're still probably going to end up being screwed but it is important to play at least a couple of basic lands in case your opponent has a field of ruin or two on their side of the table or in their deck somewhere and a lot of people do especially people that play one or two colors right now and can actually afford to play colorless lands they tend to use those slots on field of ruin that's why way back at the beginning in that goblin deck i elected to play one copy of field of ruin that's just in case we come up against a, a player of this deck who is not wise enough to include a basic land or two and you'd be surprised how many people aren't but i know what you're actually here for you want to build five color decks how do i build five color mana bases so i've actually got two of those that i want to look at real quick this one i'm going to build off the top of my dome the other one i've actually got pre-prepared a little bit but that's it's because it's a very very difficult one you'll see why now this one is five color deck two <laughs> even though it's the first one i'm looking at this mana base is going to be much much easier to prepare and there's a lot of reasons for that prosperous innkeeper is in the deck of Taxidermist is in the deck. Shigeki's in the deck, helping us get lands, right? Korea's Briefcase is in the deck. Asika is in the deck, getting Mana Force. The Celestis is in the deck. Binding the Old Gods can help go get Forest Forest. There's a bunch of cool new forests that I'll just have to be Triomes. So <laughs> there's a lot of help in this deck in terms of getting the mana that you need, but you still gotta build the mana base. 
So how do we go about starting to do that? Well, let's click on the deck here and see that there are 24 green cards in the deck, 14 black cards, and not a whole lot of anything else. Not, not really, and we built the deck that way on purpose. When you build your five color decks, you really ought to build them sort of like this. And honestly, my advice would be to build them better. Honestly, right, we have three red cards. The best five color decks are gonna have like one red card, <laughs> right? But honestly, the reason that there are three red cards, they're all the same card. Um, they're all the Kami uh, War down here, which is the whole reason to play this deck five colors. But you've also got Colossal Sky Turtle, right? Which you need blue mana for every now and again, but you need white and red for the Kami War. Whole reason we're playing that. But mostly, mostly the deck is a green and black deck. So let's go through and add our green black duels first. Now, all four Dark Boar Pathway, I think that's pretty easy, but I'm gonna start with three Death Cap Blades to just to start with again, because this is a five color deck and you just never know if you're going to have all the room that you need at the end. But I do think it's wise to go ahead <laughs> and add these. Now, as far as what other colors we actually need in the deck, right, white and red are in Kami War. Colossal Sky Turtle, we probably won't actually cast too often, but we do need blue for one of the channel modes on it. And then we need white for Vanishing Verse as early as turn two, but probably not very often on turn two if we can help it, but sometimes, right? So I'd say that white is actually the third color in this deck and then blue and then red. That's just because it's not super important to cast or even use the channel ability on Colossal Sky Thurl. It's gonna be incredibly important that we can cast this Vanishing Verse. I think we can all agree, so. Let's go ahead and look at green white and add some, say, uh, pathways first. Let me actually find <laughs> The pathway, it's right there, Dev. <laughs> what are you doing? Add three of those and then two overgrown farmland just to start off. Now in black and white, I'm not going to add too many of these, but I do want two bright climb pathways and at least one shattered sanctum. Now we've got 11 spots left for lands in the stack. Now that means that we need both blue or and red mana. We, we have to have that, but there's a couple of other things that we need to consider. A lot more of our lands need to make green at this point. It seems like a lot of our lands do make green, but it's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and we probably need at least 16 green sources. So a lot of our lands are gonna have to also make green. Now there's an easy way to do this, even with only 11 slots left in the deck, and that is all of the Triomes. Now we can play Zyator's Proving Ground as at least a one of. I may come back. I didn't wanna say the World Tree yet, but that was gonna be the last addition to the deck, but. We want to play World Tree in a five color deck. <laughs> so let's go ahead and add that, which is also just a green source, by the way. But as far as other triomes go, let's go Jetmere's Garden. We know that we want to play that. And let's play the Bant triome as well, Spar's Headquarters. Now, I'm only playing a one of each of these right now, but it's very likely that will increase. As a matter of fact, I think it's almost a certainty that we're going to increase the number of Zyator's Proving Grounds. This is a black and green dual land that cycles. Like if nothing else, it at least does that, right? But this will also sometimes add the red for Kami War. So I think this is just a definite three or even potential four of, but I'm gonna stick to three for now. Now I'm also gonna go ahead and add one copy each of Jetmere's Garden and one copy of Spar's Headquarters as well, because similarly, this is a green and white land <laughs> that can cycle, right? But sometimes it'll make the blue Spar's Headquarters will for Colossal Sky Turtle or Kami War. Jetmere's Garden sometimes will make the red, right, for Kami War. So I, I also think these are probably worth at least a couple of, even though we're now on seven different <laughs> triomes. I think that that is the upper limit of what you'd want to play. So now we have reached these 16 green sources that I was talking about at the beginning of, of building this mana base. And I think that we can maybe stop there, but we don't necessarily have to. Let's look next at what we want these remaining three lands to do. Now, I think that these remaining three lands, one or more of them should make white mana. One or more of them should be a basic land. That way we don't get completely bodied by a single copy of Field of Ruin. Right, I think we need at least one basic in the deck, and it's very likely going to be a green basic. I'm just gonna let you know. But you could also make an argument for a swamp as our one basic land, because we've got a Blood Chief's Thirst in the one drop slot. So let's say opponent goes first, plays a bad creature, like an amazing creature. Bad meaning good 
on turn one that we'd really like to take care of, right? We can just drop Swamp, Blood Chief's Thirst. Wouldn't be able to do that <laughs> otherwise. But you could also make the argument that Binding the Old Gods could go get a Singleton's, you know, forest. But I don't actually think that's an important argument considering we have so many of these, you know, triomes that, um, you know, all of our triomes can be fetched up by a binding. So we shouldn't necessarily have to play a single copy of Forest or anything like that. Um, so I, honestly, I think that Swamp might be our one of basic here. Also, let's look at how many black sources we actually have in our deck. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Not quite enough to cast this Meat Hook Massacre, I don't think. So I think a good idea would be not only to play a Swamp, but to perhaps play a single copy of Hive of the Eye Tyrant. It all depends on whether or not you play Hive or Takenuma here. Also, you might want to play, say, a copy of Beseju instead of a Forest. That would be a thing to do, right? But it's kind of difficult once you get down to this part of it to decide what exactly is most optimal. We have two slots left after we added our Swamp. And again, I do think the Swamp is probably what I what I want the most here um, for a variety of reasons. But we do need at least one more Black Source, I think, if not more. And we need a little bit more in terms of, you know, other colors of mana. So let's take a quick look and see how this might look to us. A single copy of Xander's Lounge. Do we already have too many tapped lands in the deck? Somewhat likely. As far as untapped lands, how many do we have? Swamp, two Bright Climb Pathways, four Dark Boar Pathways makes seven. Uh, three Branch Lot Pathways makes ten. Uh, that is it. <laughs> so I think it would probably behoove us to have a total of 12 untapped lands in this deck. Uh, I think that's probably the least we could ask. <laughs> of ourselves so it is kind of tough I think that our next option needs to be a pathway so let's take a quick look at our options here hinge gate probably not bright climb actually shows some promise I think that a third bright climb pathway might be a really good idea clear water pathway potential again potential um I think you can make an argument here for one Bright Climb, one clear water. I think you could. As far as red mana goes, how do we actually do it outside of Zyathor's Proving Ground? We have Prosperous Innkeeper, Reclusive Taxidermist, Valky, by the way, costs red mana, Courier's Briefcase, Asika, Celestis. So that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 17 ways of making red mana. Uh, and then also World Tree. Uh, technically 18. <laughs> but, you know, we need one red mana, basically, aside from Valky, in this deck. So, I don't know that we actually need one of these. I really don't. You know, as long as we get a Zyator's Proving Ground, we have red. So I do think I will go with one Bright Climb and one Clear Water here. And we'll probably be fine. You know, everything I said about getting red mana also applies to blue mana. If we want to cast the channel on, on Colossal Sky Turtles. So I think at the end of the day, we're doing pretty good here, right? One, two, three, four Black Sources. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, sixteen. Yeah, sixteen Black Sources. That's pretty good. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. It's really 20 uh, green sources. So, yeah. End of the day, I think this is pretty much exactly where you want to be. If we want white sources, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, that's plenty. That's plenty, in my opinion, to cast like the one white card in the deck. And of course, it doesn't count things like Celestis or creatures that can make any color mana or whatever. So, you know, you do have to cast Planar Bridge, Valky, Kami War, and all that. But it should be really, really easy with this particular mana base. Because this is one of the easier five color mana bases you could be working with right now. We actually get to play three copies of different dual lands, which you don't see every day. 
Now here is the deck layout in the form that you wanted to see it. I'm sorry, you're probably screaming at me, but this, this is what it ended up shaking out looking like. Just go ahead and take a screenshot. If you would, please. I know you've been doing it. If you, you haven't been doing that, do that. What are you doing? <laughs> Take screenshots. <laughs> anyway, this is what it ended up looking like. I think some people could make the case there are too many tap lands in this deck, especially too many of these triomes. But I don't actually think that that's true, personally. I think the number one problem with this deck that we're looking at right here isn't in the mana base. <laughs> I think it's the fact there's no sweeper in the main except for the two copies of Meadook Massacre. Probably the biggest issue here, to be honest. Probably need some Doom Scars or something like that. But the mana base should actually be one of the better parts of the whole deck. But what if uh, your deck was the biggest mess in the entire world and it was by forced design that it ended up that way? Well, then you would have a meeting of the five deck, which is what we have right here. Should I play this deck on stream? Probably. I probably will very soon. Uh, but <laughs> gotta build the mana base for it first. This is uh, probably the messiest possible deck that you could think of in standard right now. You don't get a whole lot of options <laughs> for two drops, period. Right? But we are still more or less a green base deck. But when you click over here, you'll notice that there are 24 green cards, just like the last deck. But there are 22 red, 17 black, 12 blue, 14 white. There's just too many of every single color. This is not the way you want to build a deck, but building around meeting of the five kind of forces you into building that kind of deck. So, and again, the last deck got help from Asika and binding the old gods, fetching lands for it and stuff like that. This one does get reclusive taxidermist, so did that one, but it doesn't get prosperous innkeeper or like Curry's briefcase or any of that. We just, Celestis, we just do not have as much help in this deck. So what do you do? Well, in this standard, we're probably going to do a fair number of leaning on um, triomes again, <laughs> but that's just how it is. If you want to build this deck right now, in really any deck that's five colors in a format where you just don't have help enough in you know the card base outside of lands um, to build a five color deck this is just kind of what you have to do so we ended up on the three copies of Zyator's Proving Ground we ended up on three copies here of Jetmere's Garden because again remember we had a fair number of white in the deck as well as a fair number of green and red Jetmere's Garden is an important one we have two copies of Rafine's Tower here, because even though these aren't as important of colors, you still need them to cast important things like Void Rend and Rafine, which is a very good card a lot of the time. I actually, if you can't tell, I've played games with this deck. Um, it's mm, it's fun when it works. One copy of Xander's Lounge, a copy of Spara's Headquarters is also in here. So there's basically every single trial, because when you don't have help, you got to take it where you can get it. It's basically how that works. Now this is also one of those decks where you just can't play like all four copies of all the pathways you want to play because then you'd have 100 cards in your deck. So we're going to play three copies of Crag Crown Pathway because there's a lot of green and red if you remember. Let's take another look. 22 and 24, two most represented colors in the deck. So lots of Crag Crown Pathway. But we've also got a couple of Branch Loft Pathway, a couple of Dark Boar Pathway. Note how much green we're putting in the deck in just Pathways. Um, there's also Bark Channel Pathway, a couple, again, a lot of green in the Pathways in this deck. Um, and that is mostly because we need untapped mana on turn two that is green for Azusa's and uh, Reclusive Taxidermist, right? Uh, I don't love Reclusive Taxidermist. I do love Azusa's Many Journeys. <laughs> this card has been really, really sweet. Uh, but you need to cast it on turn two. So you need, you know, either tapped green mana on one into an untapped source. Or you need, you know, tapped thing on one into untapped green source. So there's a lot of green pathways in this deck to help explain that. But anyway, where did I leave off? Aside from that, we've also got, um. oh, yeah, 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 these slow lands. <laughs> Death Cap. How many of those did we end up on? Two, one copy of Death Cap. Yeah, I don't think we have more than one copy of any of these slow lands. Um, Rockfall Veil, which you might think, if any of these, Rickfall. <laughs> Rockfall Veil. Just one copy of that. Which ones did we actually end up playing? Well, again, mostly green, but we've also got a Haunted Ridge in there, along with the Deserted Beach. And... To finish off these slow ones, 
Oh, that's not correct, actually. We've got an overgrown farmland. And, finally, a Dream Root Cascade. But, there's two more lands in this deck. And one of them is the World Tree, which you might assume, again, there's one thing you need in this deck. <laughs> this one really gets no help. It is the World Tree. Now, we have to put one more land into this deck. What could that possibly be? Now, you might think that it would be a forest. You might think it would just be a forest, right? But let's say our opponent succeeds in Field of Ruining Us or something like that. Well, it is definitely past turn two. 100% is past turn two. It takes effectively three mana to Field of Ruin, right? So we've already played these two, these green two drops, one would assume. So you could argue that they would take out our only green source, and then we draw one of these on like turn four that we want to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you could you could assume that. Although you almost never want to play a Zeus as many journeys past turn two or three, very likely. But um, I don't know. The second half of a Zeus as many journeys can be really good. Becomes blocked, untap three lands, play a three drop. It's gonna be great. But still, for the most part, you uh you've already played these cards by the time you get Field of Ruin. So since we have so much green in the pathways, since we have so much green in these you know triomes. What is the next color that we should be playing, right? So red, obviously, was our very strong, you know, secondary option. But again, I think here it should be black because we just don't have a million black sources in this deck, right? It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. 10 black sources. And look, look at all that black. Look at Riveteer's Charm is a three of. Unleash the Inferno is a two of. Zytor's Envoy. Evelyn. You know, that's a lot of black in Evelyn, right? And then Hostile Takeover is a four of. Meeting is obviously a three of, and it's got black in it. So I think that we should probably make this a black source. And that black source, again, probably just a swamp. In case we do get Field of Ruin, we can take one Field of Ruin to the chin. And be okay, so long as the swamp wasn't in our first three or four, you know, ten cards or whatever. So, and I know it's arena. Very often it will be in our first ten cards to teach us a lesson against a field of ruin player. But you know, we can try to pad that lesson from being learned just a little bit. And I think we get one slot for a basic land in the stack, and that slot should again not be a green source like you might expect. I think black is actually even better, and that is the finished product right here. Now. I wouldn't, uh, you can try this deck out. It's a lot of fun <laughs> when it works, but a lot of the time, the problem with this deck is is in these cards, is in, <laughs> is in these like 30 some odd cards. The mana base so far for this deck has actually been working very well for me. Um, it's the whole reason that it was already written out in this video is because I've actually um, spent most of the time preparing for this video getting this mana base correct. So <laughs> there's a lot of tweaks have gone on in there. Um, and there are definitely reasons for that. Again, with this one, you mostly just want to be able to make sure that you can actually play your hostile takeover. So you need enough blue sources, but not too many blue sources, right? You want a lot of green sources because there's a ton of green in your deck. A lot of red, a lot of black, right? So we're kind of a base jund that still actually has to play blue and white cards like Voidrin, Hostile Takeover, the one copy of Rafine, stuff like that. So we really are kind of balanced out in all the different stuff that we're playing in this deck. And so the mana base needs to be balanced as well. And I actually think we've done a pretty good job of making this deck make the colors that it needs. That's the miracle here, not the deck itself. I regret to report that Meeting of the Five will never be a good card, but the mana base actually does work here. Did you take your screenshot? Did you do it? Because I'm going to make my head really big. I'm going to do it. I'll take a screenshot. Three, two, one. Play the deck. I'm telling you, it's fun. Although, you might not have all the wild cards for a deck as stupid as this. And if you don't, I'm probably going to be playing something like this, or exactly this even, on stream a little bit later this week. You know, again, the laryngitis is clearing up. I'm starting to feel better. I'm back in fighting shape. I'm a little skinnier. Um, I gained back a little bit more weight. But now I'm so <laughs> Didn't eat anything for a week again, so I'm skinny. Uh, I would not recommend this diet. Don't do it. It's really bad for you. But anyway, it's because I was sick. But anyway, don't get sick. I wouldn't recommend that either. But anyway, that is all about building mana bases in standard. I have a headache. Um, there's a lot to it, right? And sometimes it's not necessarily 
the most interesting sounding thing in the world, especially when you're building the deck <laughs> at the time. And you're like, well, I just want to be done with this. But there are so many little ins and outs beyond just, well, how many white cards are in the deck and how many green cards are in the deck? You know, it's not just that, right? It's how many different pips of each color at what spot on the curve. And aside from that, right, how many cards in my main deck help me make the mana that I want to make? And how does that affect my mana base? How many creature lands can I play? How many legendary lands can I play? And I think we covered a good bit of that in this video our reasons for why and why not and all that so if you have any other things you want to talk about as far as lands go or anything just life in general really get at me in the comments section we'll have a little bit of discussion we'll extend things and um of course you can check out the patreon especially if you want a couple of outtakes from this video um i think we're going to be posting those on the patreon relatively soon and um aside from that you can check me out on twitch where we play magic from a play this deck it's twitch.tv slash svmtgdev. Link in the description for all of the things I'm mentioning, plus some other videos that you may have missed over the past week. So aside from that, I hope you enjoyed this, and I'm sorry for the scratchy voice. I hope that it actually came across extremely sexy and, and attractive, but I highly doubt it. I almost talk like this the whole time. You see, this is actually very good for my voice. I've been told to talk like this, but I wasn't sure that this is what you would have wanted for 40 minutes. But I enjoy it. My wife enjoys it. She's been calling me the Batman. A little too much information, but still. I enjoy talking this way, but I didn't think you would want me to do this for 40 minutes. So I've, I've been talking in sort of my an approximation of my normal voice, and I hope it wasn't too much. But I love you all, and I will see you again. We'll be back to regular YouTube content super soon, as soon as I get over the rest of this crud and all that. But... I love you, and I will catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, wizards. Spread love and be kind.